All right, hello. Hello, everybody's settling in. I think uh, the last few people I saw checking in have checked in. Um, so please feel free to get yourself uh, something to drink. But I'd like to welcome you to the 12th Annual Veterans Celebration Dinner. I'm Blake Zanbergen. I'm the chair of the Troop Care Ministry team, and I'll be your MC this evening. Uh, this year, we decided to have the dinner early so you can all take part in whatever ritual you have on actual Veterans Day, which of course is next Saturday, not now. Um, personally, I usually get together with uh, some of my veteran friends. We have lunch or dinner. Uh, this year, we're actually going to go to the Charles Schwab Golf Tournament downtown and watch that. Uh, we just made plans yesterday. So uh, whatever you might have planned, we hope you have a great Veterans Day. Our Troop Care Ministry team is listed on the back of your program. Being a veteran myself, I'm always impressed at the commitment and desire they have to help and serve our veterans, active troops, and their families. Most of them are here tonight, and I'll be, I'll be pointing them out to you as we go. Please thank them uh, for what they do for our Desert Hills family, if you get a chance to tonight. And know that you can always reach out to any of us with any concerns or needs. We'd also like to invite any of you that would like to become more involved to join our committee or help with the activities that we do, which are also listed on the back of the program. Um, I'll highlight the big ones though. Obviously this dinner tonight, uh, we bring, we collect books at the Cave Creek Library that they're gonna dispose of every month and we bring them to the VA hospital. Uh, they have a, a library there and they can take the books home with them if they want, use them and return them. But we do that every month. Um, we also, uh, provide, uh, I'm sure you've seen, we have a grocery gift card drive in February. Um, and we collect those and give them to the Family Support Center out at Luke Air Force Base. Uh, and our, an another one of our really big projects is that we send care packages to active troops every quarter. Uh, the Christmas packages will be packed on November 28th. I was gonna confirm that was Shirley. I don't see where she went. Yeah, All right. <laughs> um, so if you'd like to participate, please ask Shirley Klein what you can do. She's right there, I'm sure you all know her. Um, and we talked about being impressed. She takes great pride in that program and she knows every single person's story on that list of troops. So it's always impressive to get together with her. So thank you, Shirley. Uh, if you've come to our dinner the past couple of years, you've heard from two veterans, Winnie Fritz and Rose Maddy. They are affiliated with the Veterans Heritage Project. Well, they're a part of our military family. This year, we're keeping it in the church family. Ken Farmer will tell us his story of service. If you haven't already, uh, please take time to look at some of the photos and uniforms that he brought that we have uh, displayed there in the corner towards the pie room. So I'm, that's why we decided to put it there. I'm sure everybody will see it since it's near the pie room. Um, after he speaks and answers some questions, We'll enjoy the food that all of our volunteers have worked on, and we'll also have trivia questions and dessert. Yes. So tonight we have Jeffrey Anthony, Heather Baldwin, Dale Nelson, and Donna Wild, also known as the Fountain Hill Saxophone Quartet, once again providing music for us. Thank you to them. Uh, they will get the evening started off by playing the national anthem after which we'll remember the veterans that have passed away. This year, we made sure to invite the spouses and loved ones of those lost, so they would know that they are still part of our military family as well as our church family. I'd like to ask that after the national anthem, they remain standing so we can recognize them. So now, please rise for the national anthem if you're able. <laughs>
Uh, we'll come back. Uh, please be seated. Uh, except for the loved ones of those lost, we'd like them to remain standing for a moment. If you can, it looks like most of you sat. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to express our feelings of shared loss for your family and want you to know that we are here for you as fellow veterans and your church family. As we recognize and honor your loved one's service to their country, we hope it gives you comfort knowing how deeply grateful we are. Please be seated now as we honor the fallen. Alan Everest. Hugh Schultz. Chris Heidrich. Tom Purnell. Paul Meredith. Douglas McFetters. Will Marker. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing these fellow veterans into our lives. We thank them, we respect them, we honor them, and we know you will watch over them and their families. Please bless them with peace and comfort. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, now we will sing the songs of the branches, the service songs. You can sing all of the songs, and please do. But if you could stand for your branches song, that would be great. Thanks.
I don't know if we see or if we had any takers on the Coast Guard uh, song, but my, I, I was singing, yes. <laughs> now I know my son back there is going to wonder when we're going to have the Space Force song. I'm sure they have one, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I don't know that one yet. When we when we need it, we'll 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 get it. All right. Uh, Active duty? Okay. It was a, it's a catchy tune. I just didn't see anybody standing up. <laughs> so, but I didn't see Conrad really singing really loud for the Marine song either. So he's a newbie coming back. So maybe when the others come back, we'll have some Coast Guard. All right. Now, Troop Care's Kim George, who handles all our announcements, is I think going to be our secretary. And also decorated the room uh, with Alan and Sarah Sabransky over there. Want to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Blake. When you're done, okay. When you're done, if you don't want it, you just kind of put it down yeah. beside. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Is it working? Or closer. Okay. Like Blake said, my name is Kim George, and um, member of the Troop Care Ministry, and I just want to say that I'm honored to serve on the troop care ministry. I, I can't say enough um, about our veterans. Thank you so much for what you've done for our country. I, I wasn't in the military myself, uh, but many of our family members, my father-in-law who couldn't make it tonight, is a retired Air Force colonel. And um, I know the sacrifices that you all have made, and not just the service member themselves, but the, the wife, the, the spouse, the husband, wife, the children. Um, what you do for our country is, is just beyond um, the gratitude that we can show you here tonight. So thank you so much. So my job tonight is to introduce our speaker. And as Blake said, we're blessed to have a member of our own congregation. And I think that's why we have such an amazing turnout. Uh, last year was good, but this is just great. So it's so nice to see such a good turnout to recognize our veterans. So I want to go through his background just to tell you a little bit about our speaker. Um, our speaker, as you know, is Major General Retired Dr. Ken Farmer. And Dr. Farmer has got quite an extensive uh, career. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. I wonder um, how you fit all this into your, into your life thus far, sir. Uh, he served 32 years uh, on active duty in the Army. He retired in 2006 as a Major General. He was the Commanding General of Walter Reed Army Medical Center and the Deputy Surgeon General of the Army as well as the commander of several other hospitals and regions during Desert Storm. He commanded a deployed hospital in Saudi Arabia. He also served as command surgeon of the US European Command and of the 101st Airborne Division. He is airborne, air assault, and flight surgeon qualified. If anything happens in here tonight, I think we're gonna be in good hands, right? <laughs> He came to the Valley with his lovely wife, Pat, in 2006 um, as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Phoenix-based TriWest Healthcare Alliance, which provided the private sector support for the military health system's West region, serving nearly 3 million TRICARE beneficiaries. In 2013, Dr. Farmer started a consulting business and provided support to the Veterans Administration as well as many other public and private entities. From 2016 to 19, he was the CEO of a privately held company which owns and operates senior living communities, skilled nursing facilities, and home health care operations in Washington and in California, and he remains on their board of directors. In May of 2020, uh, Dr. Farmer took on the new pandemic role as the director of the Office of Disaster Recovery for Pierce County, Washington where he advised the county executive on the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts, um, working with the health departments, county and state leaders, as well as the private sector on the best use of federal funds. He provided full-time support for a year and a half and then part-time support for another year during the pandemic. Dr. Farmer is also a graduate of Auburn University, the University of Alabama and Birmingham School of Medicine, an Army Family Practice Residency in the Army War College. He completed the mini MBA program at ASU, uh, the W.P. Carey School of Businesses Center for Services Leadership, and he later served as a guest lecturer in that program. 
He currently serves as the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, and is the past board chair of Stronger Families, a Bellevue, Washington-based nonprofit serving military and first responder families. <coughs> Excuse me. He serves on the executive committee of Crew Military and is past president of the Kiwanis Club of Stellacom, Washington. Among his many, many hobbies and interests, he enjoys running, and he has ran 43 marathons. It's just amazing, amazing. He's also an avid skier. Ken and his wife, as I said, Pat, um, they have been married for 51 years, and they call Stellacom, Washington, if I'm pronouncing that right, and Scottsdale, Arizona, their homes. They split their time between the two. They're proud parents of four sons, and they have 11 grandchildren. And again, I don't know how you fit all that in, but so without further ado, I have the honor of, ref of introducing Major General Retired Dr. Kim Farmer. Well, thank you, Kim. And uh, good evening, fellow Desert Hills members and guests. And uh, I want to thank the Troop Ministry Committee for putting on this annual tribute to veterans and for this year taking a chance in inviting one of your own as guest speaker. And I hope I won't disappoint you. Next slide. <laughs> our, our nation's citizens and political and military leaders expect that the care delivered to its deployed sons and daughters, husbands and wives will be the standard of care in our country, not the standard of care in a remote, underdeveloped country where the troops are deployed, not even the standard of care in a remote section of our country, but the standard of care in Seattle or uh, Phoenix. It's, uh, you know, the expectation that whether you live in Seattle or Phoenix or Loop uh, over on the Navajo Reservation, you're going to get Harborview or Mayo level uh, care wherever and whenever you're injured. And they do, but it's hard and it hasn't always been that way. Now, what's involved in meeting this challenge to deliver that kind of care anywhere, anytime, under any conditions, and often with very little advanced warning? It involves recruiting and retaining and training all kinds of healthcare professionals, doctors, dentists, nurses, physical therapists, pharmacists, etc. And training them not just to perform in a hospital medical center environment, but to perform their art and craft and science in the belly of a ship or the tent in a remote area. It involves equipping them with equipment and drugs equivalent to what they would have here at Mayo, but that can withstand the shipment and then perform at in the Mideast desert summers or the Afghanistan mountain winters. It involves trade-offs in evacuation and, and forward surgical capability and decisions about when to move the care forward to where the casualty might be versus when to move the casualty back to where the care might be most appropriately located. And as our nation's military medical capability has evolved, it has contributed enormously to the advancement of American civilian medicine. The forcing function of practicing in a military environment has taught healthcare professionals things that simply cannot be learned and experienced in a civilian environment. And healthcare writ large is better for it. Next slide. A month after our army was formed, General Washington asked the Continental Congress to create a hospital for the army to care for the sick and wounded. A few months later, Congress created the Navy, and those tiny ships of the fleet had sick bays where Navy surgeons practiced their art. While these Army and Navy surgeons knew nothing of the germs and how diseases were really caused, they did have, through their powers of observation, they would often address overcrowded living conditions or poor food, unhealthy water, 
sanitary practices in an effort to prevent disease rather than have to treat it. Now, getting line officers to listen and act on their advice was a challenge then, and it's still a challenge sometimes. But after having two campaigns nearly destroyed due to smallpox, General Washington took the unprecedented step of ordering mass inoculation with a now obsolete method of exposure to small amounts of the smallpox virus to develop immunity. But it worked. It protected the force and for the rest of the campaign, and it may have actually saved the colonists' cause. The British, as most Europeans, had mostly been exposed to smallpox and had immunity. The Americans were just being exposed and didn't. This was a harbinger of things to come. Uh, inoculating military units to protect both the individuals and the military force from disease. And it was also an early example of the power of vaccinations. But facing disease during that Revolutionary War time was more dangerous than facing the Redcoats. And we had about 10 soldiers died from disease for every one that died from wounds. Next slide. Now, in the War of 1812, things were a little better. Uh, thoracic and abdominal wounds were almost always fatal, and gangrene often resulted in or from amputations. Building on Washington's earlier directive, however, the all Army soldiers were vaccinated with Dr. Edward Jenner's new cowpox vaccine to prevent smallpox. The Navy surgeon conducted experiments showing that, with, with lime juice and lemonade, that convinced the Navy to issue citrus fruits to ships to prevent the huge problem of scurvy. We understand much more today about the relationship of diet and health, but this lesson from the Navy was an important example of the power of using data to drive decisions and improve health. Next slide. Now, not long after that second war with Britain, Congress authorized a medical department at Army headquarters level. The newly appointed Surgeon General went about collecting information from every installation, post camp and station where the soldiers were deployed in an effort to, for the first time, get a serious examination of the health of the Army and the diseases that affected it. Interestingly, his insistence on collecting climate and uh, 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 weather data led to the origins of the Army Signal Corps and the U.S. Weather Service. Army frontier surgeons had the opportunity sometimes to do research, and Dr. William Beaumont, after the saving the life of a soldier who was shot in the abdomen and uh, saving his life, he studied the soldier's fistula and published his observations on the processes of the digestive system, which won him international acclaim. William Beaumont Army Medical Center at Fort Bliss, Texas is named uh, for him. But General Winfield Scott uh, lost a third of his command to disease during the 1840s Mexican War in the Veracruz and Mexico City campaigns, and line soldiers had to be detailed to move and take care of these uh, uh, diseased soldiers, further depleting the force, for it was not until 1856 that Congress authorized enlisted hospital stewards. In 1850, the Navy established a naval laboratory in Brooklyn, where a young assistant surgeon by the name of E.R. Squibb did experimented with the use of chloroform and ether for anesthesia. He later resigned from the Navy and founded the pharmaceutical company that bore his name, Squibb Pharmaceuticals, now known as Bristol Myers Squibb. Next slide. Now, the Army entered the Civil War ill-prepared, uh, poorly equipped, and neither well-led nor well-funded. In the first major combat of the Civil War in July of 1861, the Battle of Bull Run in Virginia, the medical support was a disaster. Casualties uh, were sometimes on the battlefield for days, occasionally weeks. Evacuation of the wounded was chaotic. Many of the wounded 
were, were left there, as I said, for long periods of time, and it didn't get mu much better in subsequent operations. Remember my comment early on about what America expects in terms of the quality for its soldiers and, and uh, military personnel? Well, concerned citizens in 1861 uh, established the U.S. Sanitary Commission to bring pressure on Congress and the public to make some changes. And in April of 1862, President Congress did start making changes to include the appointment of 37-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Letterman as the medical director of the Army of the Potomac. He observed that vitamin and nutritional deficiencies were, were uh, harming a soldiers' health, and he added fresh vegetables. He ordered improvements in field sanitation. He, ordered, he organized a system of care and evacuation, dedicated ambulances to, uh, to evacuating casualties to the nearest aid station and to a new type of field hospital. And he established a standard that within 24 hours, anyone who needed surgery would, uh, would the major operations would be performed. Set up hospital trains and ships to move large numbers of soldiers back from front to the rear. And in just a few months, Letterman's changes resulted in dramatic improvement. Whereas from 1861 to 64, we had been losing 10 to 25 percent of casualties. By 1865, it was 4%, primarily because of the improvements in battlefield evacuation and care instituted by Letterman. And drawing on the earlier work by Squibb, 99% of Union soldiers who had surgery in the field got it with anesthesia. Next slide. Coming out of the Civil War experience, uh, Army Medical Officer John Shaw Billings began the Army Medical Library, began to build the Army Medical Library and Museum, which became the National Library of Medicine and the Index Medicus, still used in use today. He also had great influence in leading Johns Hopkins Hospital and Medical School to prominence. He went on to become the, the uh, director of the New York Public Library and was instrumental in influencing Andrew Carnegie to establish community libraries around the country. <clears throat> the short Spanish-American War was another reminder of the impact of disease. While we only lost about 280 soldiers from, uh, from uh, killed in action in, uh, and about 1,500 wounded, over 2,500 soldiers died of disease, many from typhoid and yellow fever. So the Army Surgeon General established a typhoid board, and he put young Major Walter Reed, who you see in the upper right, <clears throat> to head it. The board identified some factors causing it and some things that could be done to uh, prevent it. And a few years thereafter, Army Major Frederick Russell developed a typhoid vaccine, and the Army began in 1909 a vaccination program. Dr. Reed was then sent to Cuba to head a yellow fever board. And in dramatic investigative work, which included exposing himself to mosquito bites in the laboratory, <clears throat> he, uh, he proved that the 80s uh, Egypti mosquito spread yellow fever. And that, together with the mosquito control programs instituted by Colonel William Gorgas, is what made possible the completion of the Panama Canal. In 1910, Army Major Carl Darnell discovered water chlorination. And three years later, Major William Lister developed a technique using calcium hypochlorite in large Lister bags that could then uh, quickly in the field uh, uh, purify water. Prior to this, they had to boil water, as you see there, or use untreated water. And these advances in purifying large quantities of water in the field had, it had dramatic effect in reducing losses to, uh, to disease. The Navy developed new and effective systems for ventilating ships, a harbinger of their becoming a leader in environmental and occupational medicine. Next slide. When America entered World War I in 1917, the British 
identified the Allies' greatest need. Send us doctors. The U.S. answer was sending Red Cross base hospitals, which was an amalgamation of military, reserve, and civilian doctors from some of our leading uh, uh, institutions, such as Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and Cleveland Clinic. This further cemented interaction between the military, medicine, and our nation's leading academic medical centers. The field of aviation medicine was born in World War I as physicians assigned to the Army Air Force uh, began reconfiguring various aircraft to evacuate patients. Now, after three years at war, the French, when we got over there, had, uh, had developed some new practices in surgical procedures, and the Americans adopted the French system of triage, separating the casualties by severity of their wounds and the need for immediate surgery. And triage remains today the standard of, way, of the way emergency and disaster medicine is approached. A second technique learned from the French was debridement, or debridement, which is the removal of all foreign tissue and dead or dying tissue from the wound. But the worldwide influenza pandemic of 1918 and 19 killed millions across the globe, and deaths from influenza and respiratory disease accounted for 80% of losses, more than from the enemy. No wonder that even today, the military is a leader in flu shot implementation. Now, increasing specialization was beginning to occur in American medicine by that time, and advisory groups and specialty hospitals were improving care and uh, it's, next slide. By World War I, or in, in World War I had seen the birth of two new specialties, aviation and submarine medicine. And Navy and Army Air Corps medical personnel would become leaders in learning how to protect the human body from hypobaric and hyperbaric environments. And aviation medicine became a national program with military experts working with civilian institutions to develop G-suits and improved oxygen equipment and pressurized cabins and night vision training. And the consultants advisory groups that I mentioned that had begun to be started after World War I by World War II had matured so that Lieutenant Colonel Michael DeBakey realized the value of a standardized approach to surgical cases. And he published technical bulletins to implement such standards for the first time. Dr. DeBakey noted that a combat surgeon at a frontal hospital would see more trauma in a day than he would in years in, in most civilian practices. Dr. DeBakey subsequently became one of the most famous heart surgeons in the world, received the Congressional Medical Medal of Honor, and today published standards of care are commonplace and followed by our nation's leading medical institutions, military and civilian. Now, for centuries, wound infection had been the most persistent uh, problem for combat surgeons. The sulfa drugs developed in the 30s and penicillin in the 40s began to change that for surgery and disease. Japan sees the world's largest uh, supplier supply of um, quinine which was used to treat malaria. So the U.S. developed and then mass-produced Adabrin, a synthetic quinine that helped to stem the losses from malaria by our forces in the Pacific Theater due to, uh, to strictly enforced mandatory daily doses. The sparing use of blood transfusions in World War I led to much study in the interwar years and the effective use of blood and plasma during World War II uh, for, to maintain blood pressure and treat shock in wounded soldiers became one of the most significant developments of the war and carried over to civilian practices. Surgical teams performed definitive surgery closer to the front than previously thought possible due to the, the, the troops in the Pacific Islands, uh, there was no way to evacuate them. So we figured out how to give that definitive care there. From 1942 to 45, in the European theater alone, 
with about 2 million disease non-battle injury cases, we only lost 0.1% of those. And only 4% of Americans wounded in action died, whereas it had been nearly twice that in World War I. And in 1944, the first helicopter medical evacuation mission took place in Burma. Next slide. Now, following every war, there has been a dismantling of the services, and with it, the military medical force. And within a year of Japan's surrender, the impressive medical structures of the Army, the Navy, and the Army Air Forces were torn asunder. But medical support needed to be provided, especially public health support in occupied Europe and Korea and Japan. And the, the, the services figured that one way of attracting and keeping uh, physicians was through graduate medical education, the offering of internships, residencies, and fellowships, which remains today a key part of how we get and keep and train our medical force. But the outbreak of war in Korea in 1950 saw us critically short, and a doctor draft law was passed in 1950, bringing in newly trained residents of every specialty. The Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, MASH, had just been established, and many were deployed to Korea. And these young surgeons coming out of civilian practice, working with more seasoned folks from the Walter Reeds and other military medical centers in Korea, began to uh, be, be creative. And one of the things they did was using uh, doing vascular surgery with autologous vein grafts, veins harvested from the patient in order to, uh, to, to, to bypass uh, an arterial, do an arterial repair. And by 1953, that kind of repair was common and routinely successful. Neurosurgical detachments were deployed to join the mashes to provide head and brain surgery. In 1950, the helicopters finally became dedicated to the medical evacuation mission. And it was during this Korean conflict that the first Navy ship was fitted with a helipad, allowing a couple of Navy ships to go up and down the Korean Peninsula and serve as floating hospitals. To uh, And this was in part responsible for the uh, lowest mortality rate from wounded in Korea in any uh, conflict to date at 2.4 percent. Next slide. Now the Cold War years saw the re a reemergence of medical research, and that included the development of chloroquine, an anti-malarial malarial drug, and then other drugs for chloroquine-resistant malaria, and follow-on drugs for leishmaniasis treatment, and these were instrumental in in the losses from disease in Vietnam being about one-third of what they had been in the Pacific theater during World War II because of this research and development of new drugs. The Institute of Surgical Research, known as the Burn Center at Brook in San Antonio, uh, earned a worldwide reputation for its burn research and treatment to include the development of a, of a new topical antibacterial sulfamylon, which reduced losses from infection of burns by 50%. Building on the Korea experience, Navy hospital ships off the coast of Vietnam had helipads and, uh, and began doing vascular and neurosurgery, all of this supporting the, newly, the new doctrine of the golden hour, getting seriously wounded to definitive treatment within an hour of injury. Remember a century earlier, Letterman, revolutionary for the time, get surgery done within 24 hours. Now a century later, it was within an hour. And interestingly, in, of, the, of the wounded that were evacuated to uh, hospitals in Vietnam, the diet of wounds rate was actually a little higher than Korea. But that's because the helicopters were so effective in rapidly evacuating them that casualties that would have previously died in the field were now dying within the first 24 hours in the hospital. And if you back that out, 
the, the losses were way less than half of what they had been in Korea. Helicopters realized their full potential in Vietnam and the civilian community learned from this and we have not built a civilian medical center since then without a helipad. The Air Force Medical Service during this uh, time began to strengthen research in human performance and Dr. Ken Cooper working with the Air Force helped popularize the aerobic fitness throughout the U.S. and his work fueled the running boom, and as a marathon runner, I'm grateful for what Dr. Cooper did. Next slide. Now, near the end of the Vietnam War, the Army acted on studies that emphasized that the effectiveness and efficiency of doctors could be improved by the use of physician extenders. And so the Army and Baylor University created in 1972 the first physician assistant, or PA program. That program remains one of the top programs in the country. Shortly thereafter, clinical nurse practitioners began to be trained in increasing numbers. And today, PAs and nurse practitioners are an integral part of the delivery of healthcare in America, in the military and in the civilian sector. The Gulf War saw the development of ruggedized packages for deploying CT scanners and telemedicine units into theater and doctors could communicate in real-time video from Kuwait or Saudi back to Walter Reed or other medical centers here uh, to uh, get assistance with the patient. And the diet of wounds rate in the Gulf War was 0.06%. Following the Gulf War, light deployable Surgical teams were developed and training of Army frontline medics was improved to EMT and paramedic level. And the Air Force developed critical care in the air teams, which allowed for the delivery of ICU, intensive care unit capability, aboard an airplane from theater back to the US. Other developments included the ability to quickly identify a variety of pathogens that had potential for biologic warfare use, and that, such as anthrax, and that proved very beneficial after several incidents in our own country. Next slide. Now, as the U.S. entered combat operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, we were able to provide equivalent level care with 5% of the force being dedicated to medical, as opposed to 14% of the force in the previous conflicts. Part of this was because of joint medical planning, such as Army Hel Helicopter Medevac supporting the Marines and, uh, and keeping uh, casualties in theater for only a short period of time because of the robust evacuation capability. The development of clot-promoting compounds that could be packed into severe wounds and help stem blood loss, along with the uh, soldiers being, all soldiers being equipped with a tourniquet because of the realization that it was not the golden hour in somebody that had a serious arterial bleeding wound. It was a few golden minutes. So these new compounds and the issuance of tourniquets to all soldiers uh, was instrumental in now not relying on a medic being close at hand. Improved personal protective equipment for soldiers, especially ceramic body uh, armor, Kevlar, uh, impacted the survival, but also the nature of survivable injuries. And we now had soldiers that previously would have died from their thoracic or abdominal injuries, surviving, but surviving with horrible leg, arm, or head injuries. And so the signature injuries of these Afghanistan and Iraq wars became amputations and traumatic brain injuries. And these were not middle-aged sedentary uh, people who just wanted to be able to get around the house. They were young elite athletes who wanted to remain so. So amputee centers at Walter Reed and Brooke and Balboa and San Diego uh, developed new approaches to the care, treatment, and rehabilitation of amputees with specialized limbs for running and computers embedded into the uh, 
and into the prosthetics. And with different expectations, many amputees returned to full active duty. Next slide. As commanding general of Walter Reed uh, during that time of 04 to 06, I saw and got to know many of these heroes. I recall with a chuckle, President Bush visiting a soldier who had an amputation. He said, soldier, how's your leg? And he says, well, sir, and he slaps the amputated leg in prosthesis, and he says, my good leg is doing great, but this other leg is a piece of crap. He may not have said crap. Uh, now think about that for a minute. His good leg was the amputated leg. And as a result of the dramatic developments that we saw and improvements, I saw many uh, soldiers elect to electively amputate a uh, mutilated limb that was causing pain and requirement of pain medicines and disability for a prosthetic that would allow them to return to a full and productive life. Next slide. Combat casualties don't discriminate. It's clear that the women in this photo have gotten their act together, as did Lieutenant Colonel Tammy Duckworth, now Senator, U.S. Senator from Illinois, who's a double amputee. And I was fortunate, privileged to get to know when she was recovering at Walter Reed. She's a, a uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel helicopter pilot. Next slide. And since I am concluding the formal portion of my talk with that slide of beautiful women, I want to wrap up with a few comments centered on another beautiful woman sitting right there. Pat and I have been married for 51 years and have called 18 places home. Uh, she gave up a teaching career to support me and raise a family. She was the guiding force in raising four wonderful sons who all went to different high schools and different colleges in different states. The only time a son had a car accident, dad was deployed to Saudi Arabia, but mom was there. At a parent-teacher event, Pat bummed a ride from someone she barely knew to take her to the hospital when she went into labor with son number four <laughs> while I was out on night maneuvers. But, you know, Pat held off delivering until 30 minutes after I arrived at labor delivery <laughs> And then I went back out to the woods the next morning. <clears throat> we moved, she, when, when we were first considering this, she said, I'm supportive of you making this a career, but let's just not move during the boys' high school years. Okay, that sounds like a good idea, dear. We moved between the junior and senior year for three out of the four boys. But we made it work. Oldest son stayed back with another family from our church to let him finish high school. Second son, three high schools in four years, no problem. Fourth son, Pat stayed back in Washington State for the first year I was in Washington, D.C. to let him finish school there. And oh, by the way, the third son that we didn't move between the junior and senior year was in a private Christian college preparatory boarding school in New York while we were in Germany for three years. So, but somehow they all turned out well and are very close to each other and to us. And Pat created a career of volunteering, at, volunteering at chapels and churches and volunteering and leading military spouse groups, over 40 years volunteering with the American Red Cross to include starting their ch uh, chapter of the Tiffany Circle of Women Philanthropists here in Arizona and being recognized by that national organization a couple of years ago with their UNO Award as the unsung hero of the nation. Oh, and we're hosting a Red Cross event in their home next Saturday night. Now, now all of this almost didn't happen. Uh, Pat and I met on a blind date, our senior year of high school, and we hit it off instantly. But before we started our freshman year at Auburn University, I suggested that we should be open to dating others for a while. Well, I dated lots of other women and enough to know that Pat was the one. Pat dated just a couple of other guys and fell for one. <laughs> uh, well, when I was ready to make it just us, she had a decision to make. Fortunately, 
I went out. Now, the other guy, who was named Bo, went into the Marines after college, but uh, he had planned to return to the family farm in North Alabama. So decades later, shortly after I'd been promoted to Brigadier General, Pat and I were having a conversation one day, and I said, I said, well, dear, if you'd married Bo, you'd be on a farm back in Alabama. And she looked at me and said, no, Ken, if I'd married Bo, he'd be a general in the Marines, and you'd just be a farmer. <laughs> Yes, I married well. Next slide. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to speak with you this afternoon. As a veteran myself, on this Veterans Day, I thank you for honoring veterans each year by having a special program like this. Thanks. Thanks. If you want to do it, it's like mine. Yeah.